Okay, if everyone can take your seats and quiet down, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Let's go ahead and get started since I know we're on a tight schedule tonight. Um, my name is Matt Holman. I help run the joint alongside Nic uh, Nicole Bell, who's joining us via live stream somewhere in Central Oregon, and Molly Moore, who's running around somewhere. Who here is uh, attending an event at the Canby Road for the first time tonight? Wow. All right. Well, welcome. So love to have you here, especially on a, a beautiful Seattle evening. I know it's hard to to be indoors when it's that nice outside. So the, the Cambia Grove, our, our mission is really to convene and catalyze tomorrow's healthcare innovations, particularly those that um, support the consumer and also take costs out of the system. And so tonight's event, Reverse Pitch Day, is one of our, um, our flagship programs and one of the most exciting and usually one that draws the biggest crowd. And so we're so, so excited to have you all here and, and of course, Overlake, our anchor partner, that's pitching. This is our sixth uh, reverse pitch event. And uh, so far, we are five to five to, for da to date in terms of matching uh, startups with problem statements presented by our anchor, pi uh, our anchor partners. And I expect today to be no different. And um, the, the incredible opportunity here is for an early stage company to get the chance to actually work hand in hand around an innovative solution for a large enterprise um, like Overlake, which is, can be a really transformative opportunity for startups. And so we thank the entire Overlake team for committing their time and coming out, coming out tonight. And then the process that comes after this, which um, their entire executive team will be participating in two rounds of vetting that will take place um, that will eventually result in a winner. So a couple housekeeping items before I hand it off to, to Chris. Uh, so for those of you who tweet, Please follow. We'll be tweeting throughout the event uh, at Cambia Grove and at Talk to Sir. We also are live streaming, so hello to everyone watching um, online. We'll be posting the video of tonight's event online immediately following the presentation, and we'll also be uh, putting an edited version on our website by Monday. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to our Elevar Labs partner who uh, partners with us to run the reverse pitch program. Chris. Thank you, Matt. It's a real pleasure to have everyone here today. Uh, we have a really exciting evening for everyone. Just wanted to kind of give a quick breakdown to uh, let everyone know how tonight's going to be structured. We're going to kick it off with some opening remarks and a brief presentation highlighting some of the emerging trends in digital health. And then we're just going to go straight to business and then have uh, some of our illustrious panel from, uh, uh, from Overlake speak about the specific needs that they're looking for and looking to the entrepreneurial community to solve those. So we're just going to hop right into it. And then following that, we'll have a 10 minute break and then follow that up with a panel discussion uh, containing a number of illustrious executives from both the venture capital, executive uh, enterprise community and um, really kind of tie that all together to understand exactly what, why there's this recent emergence of uh, the partnership between startups and enterprise. And uh, we'll follow it up then with um, some helpful tips on how to effectively engage with Overlake. So we highly recommend that you stay for the panel presentation afterwards, since we'll have an opportunity to kind of share um, some lessons from past programs on how you can succeed in this program. And then finally, we'll finish it off with some networking. And we highly recommend staying through the networking, since we have a lot of uh, free food and drinks out here that needs to be consumed before the end of the night. So um, look forward to meeting all of you. So overall, as Matt indicated, um, it's, a real, it's a real privilege to have all these organizations here today. Uh, Overlake Medical Center has come here today to uh, commercialize amazing innovations that address real industry needs. They're looking for a startup or a set of startups that would be willing to innovate a specific need to their specific challenges and potentially develop a long-term partnership. And um, they're seeking an opportunity to create that long-term partnership with your startup. 
Cambia Grove uh, has leveraged its resources and incredible relationships with the Pacific Northwest community to really bring everyone here together today. Uh, a digital health startup community that it's trying to build to really make the Pacific Northwest a hub for digital health innovation, not just in the region, but also serve as a national model for the country in terms of really bringing together entrepreneurs, innovators with uh, executives with years and decades of experience in healthcare. And then finally, Elevar will be helping uh, really bridge that divide by bringing the startup and the enterprise together through a very structured program to allow you, the startup, to have an opportunity to build that partnership. So we're really excited to see everyone today and look forward to seeing a lot of great uh, uh, companies apply for the program. One of the key questions that we get um, that oftentimes entrepreneurs really ask is, why is innovation within a large enterprise so difficult? Why can't there just simply be an executive that hops into an enterprise, shakes things up, and then makes a company that has long had these specific types of habits and um, strategic priorities just simply change them? And we wanted to sort of share with you the challenges that really exist within a large enterprise and how you can have a number of very, very talented executives who are very progressive thinking uh, face limitations and specific roadblocks in their organization, just to give you a little color about how challenging it really is. Overall, there's this uh, behavioral economics theory called prospect theory. I don't know how many of you have been to Las Vegas to play blackjack, but if you happen to um, throw a bet down and you win, you feel pretty good about it. But if you throw that same bet down and you lose, you tend to feel more worse about losing than you do winning, even though the value is the same. And within a large enterprise, oftentimes there is this uh, inherent culture of um, trying to avoid losses even though there could be a long-term potential gain. Uh, corporate cultures are oftentimes designed through decades and decades of sort of cultivation where there's a risk avoidance overall, especially in healthcare where you're dealing with people's lives. So even though there could be an incremental gain in innovation, oftentimes the risk of a potential loss oftentimes supersedes it, which thereby limits the innovation from taking place. A second uh, theory is really involving hyperbolic discounting. If you really think about large enterprises, especially public organizations, but even private ones, they are oftentimes pressured by quarterly earnings, or they're oftentimes pressured by short-term priorities. So innovations overall oftentimes don't demonstrate an ROI or a return on investment in the short term. You actually have to invest in that innovation and then see potential long-term growth. But since that doesn't necessarily fit with the immediate priorities of the company. Oftentimes an in innovation, even though it shows potential to really impact the organization at large in the long term, it oftentimes gets crushed or sort of held back in the short term simply because it doesn't meet a short term financial objective or strategic objective of the organization. The third is what we call social utility. Um, when you deal with healthcare organizations overall, especially when you're trying to structure an initiative, you oftentimes have to look at both the economic as well as the social implications of how this innovation is going to really impact the organization and the stakeholders at large. Oftentimes when you're building a new innovation, it's very difficult to really define and quantify both the economic and social return of that specific innovation. And as you know, as entrepreneurs, oftentimes your innovation goes through many pivots over the course of really developing that business model that works. So if you're really thinking about it from a social utility standpoint, it's very difficult at the very beginning when you're building an innovation for a large enterprise. If you can't define those social and economic considerations, oftentimes that innovation doesn't even get through the gate. And it may actually limit really amazing innovations from going through. And that's simply inherent with the gatekeeping process that a large enterprise typically structures, which is meant to reduce risk, which is the point of many of these large enterprises. The fourth is what we call experience waiting. Um, if you think about many of the senior executives that work at these large enterprises, th they have decades of experience and they've seen it all. And one of the things that oftentimes many of them have seen is they've actually seen a real innovation take place and actually fail in the past. And um, oftentimes these failures that occur within these large organizations are traumatic for the organizations. Oftentimes there's uh, either bur uh, bridges burned or priorities that are changed in the organization. So based on all those years of experience and having seen innovation take place and potentially not succeed in the past, oftentimes many executives view innovation with a very skeptical eye. 
they're not really willing to accept it at face value. They really want to dig deep into that. But oftentimes that specific type of mentality for many of these organizations can make it very difficult for innovation to go through. Because oftentimes innovation, you need that sort of hope, you need that sort of excitement, you need that unpredictability to see if it's going to work. But if you have a leadership team that's not really engaged to think like that, it's very difficult for that innovation to actually succeed. Next is a concept called framing. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have worked in a large enterprise before, but oftentimes when a new initiative gets built in an organization, which could be an innovation that you're creating, uh, a large organization really wants to assess every variable, every scenario, really kind of think through all the potential options, really kind of build all the relevant capabilities, and, and really want to make sure that this innovation is going to work before executing. And, and that's, that's natural in a large enterprise because a large enterprise is geared to reduce risk and, and to ensure success of an innovation. But in a way, that almost goes counter to innovation because when you have a new innovation, oftentimes you don't even really know. There's just a lot of unknowns when you're basically getting a new innovation into the system. And if you're having to do all these assessments to try to determine what's wrong with the innovation, and if you have a culture where any of those unknowns, if there's an unknown that exists, therefore it's wrong, um, oftentimes, those unknowns actually end up hampering that innovation from going through when, in fact, you need an innovation that, um, that basically has a lot of unknowns overall. So th th there's an inherent sort of culture gap where the, the unknown and excitement about an innovation may be the precise thing that basically brings that innovation down in a large enterprise. And then finally, there's this theory called predictive value. And, um, it's, it's this theory that every single decision or every single piece of information has a quantifiable value, but oftentimes the timing of that information when it's received may make that value appear greater or less than what it actually is. So um, within a large enterprise, what typically happens is that there tends to be a lot of firestorms that break out. There may be a piece of information that all of a sudden becomes a hot piece of news that could be very, very sort of eruptive within an enterprise culture. But when you kind of look at it in retrospect after it passes, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but at that time, it was a very big deal. When um, you're dealing with an innovation, oftentimes there's, these unknowns can really kind of break out in concerns and caution. And oftentimes, those specific concerns may actually derail um, the progression of an innovation taking place when, in fact, it's really not that big of a deal. It just needs that time to get vetted. So um, oftentimes, cultures within a large enterprise can kind of create that. And, and imagine yourself as an enterprise executive having to navigate that. This is really endemic in many organizations. It's not one organization or a couple in particular out of most. This is what happens typically in large organizations. So it, it really takes a lot to get an innovation through. So the uh, enterprise executive who you'll be working with at Overlake is really champion something that's naturally very difficult. And they deserve a lot of credit for having to basically navigate a lot of these variables. Um, what's really interesting, too, is that innovations, if you were a startup going to a large enterprise such as a health plan about 10 years ago, your, your chance of actually getting into an executive office would have been pretty much slim to none, simply because at the time, uh, these large uh, incumbent organizations simply didn't really work with startups. They worked with very established vendors that had a long track record in the organization. Today, uh, all, all the rules have changed in healthcare, and this is a really wonderful time to be an entrepreneur, because there's all these major parties that are really beginning to partner together to provide entrepreneurs a chance to actually break in because they see the value of entrepreneurship, they see the value of innovation. Uh, a lot of these organizations, health plans and providers, are beginning to partner with external organizations that are geared to startups. So an example is Intermountain Healthcare and Healthbox. Healthbox is a healthcare accelerator that helps uh, startups get funded as well as ingrain themselves into large enterprises. They've created a partnership with Intermountain Healthcare, a large provider system in the Rocky Mountains, um, to provide startups the opportunity to break through. And then also internally, um, many of the healthcare organizations that exist today actually have corporate venture capital units. And these provide a really unique position for many uh, entrepreneurs in the sense that not only can these corporate venture capital uh, units commercialize, identify, and fund a startup, but they could actually serve as a unique tool to help commercialize your startup and get you into other enterprises. Um, a classic example would be uh, Zafri Investments 
and Zeth Health. Zafri Investments is the corporate venture arm of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. They've been fundamental in terms of being able to help um, Zest Health, for instance, really begin to not only get the necessary funding that they need, but also help introduce them to other blues plans. And uh, Cambia, which is just right across the, uh, the, the wall over here, um, they've done a wonderful job with a number of startups in their portfolio to not only provide the necessary funding, but also expose them to many different health plans within the Blue Cross Blue Shield network. And uh, what's really interesting, too, is that all these different um, funds that are basically funding these digital health startups are, in fact, some of the largest funds in healthcare. So the corporate venture arm is really beginning to explode in terms of being able to be that prominent form of funding for startups. So when you chase that Kleiner Perkins or you chase that Sequoia, um, you may actually find value in actually looking for the corporate venture capital uh, units if that's something that aligns to kind of your business model overall. Oftentimes they're overlooked, but they're actually very helpful, not only from a funding perspective, but from a business development perspective. So kind of given all these challenges with healthcare enterprises, how can they actually advance innovation? One, they can prioritize it. By what we mean by prioritize is um, we've noticed that healthcare organizations, large organizations that develop a dedicated innovation wing, these are the organizations that tend to have more success with innovation because they prioritize it. Uh, we at Elevar actually worked with a large health plan that had about $6 billion in annual revenue. We found out that this large health plan only had a $3 million budget for innovation overall. Um, that's point, I, think, I believe that's 0.05% of their total budget um, is actually aligned to innovation. And you know what that money was spent on? It was pretty much spent on sales and marketing, basically putting billboards up, basically saying that they're an innovative company. So there's not actually really any dedicated innovation budget. But what we're noticing is that um, other organizations like Cambia Health Solutions and other ones are actually really beginning to dedicate themselves to creating a chief innovation office or create a dedicated innovation arm. The second is what we call downsiding all risk. And this is really the beauty of this program is the fact that oftentimes a reason why an innovation struggles is because it doesn't get the innovation aligned with the rest of the organization. In this case here with Overlake, you'll have an opportunity to meet a number of executives across the business, cross-functionally, not just one specific line of business, but really kind of looking at it across the business. This is incredibly important when you're trying to get an innovation through because oftentimes the innovations that you provide to a hospital or provide to a payer are cross-functional. They impact all areas of the business. So you need to have all those executives basically at the table in order to build consensus around it. Otherwise, you'll face roadblocks as you're doing your, as you're doing your business development process. The third, and this is something that we really sort of stress for you guys, this is kind of one of the hints that we're gonna provide, but we'll provide more after the panel discussion, is really defining both not only your uh, social um, value that you provide, so quantify the number of lives impacted, for instance, but also what sort of ROI are you actually providing to the organization? If you can really clearly define what your ROI is financially to an organization, as well as defining basically the lives impacted or the social impact, and really have a justified case for explaining why your innovation provides that value from a quantifiable level, it's gonna really provide you that uh, ammunition that you're gonna need to succeed and really defend yourself when you go through all those gates. And then finally, um, what large organizations are doing is they're beginning now to leverage third parties. And this is really where you guys come in. Um, they're beginning to develop their own innovation programs and they're beginning to partner with startups to um, find innovations because they realize some of the best innovators are not within our organization but are running these small companies in greater Seattle. So um, that's all for this and I'll hand it over to Uftar who can talk about the program itself. Yeah, thanks Chris. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Thanks. So, Really quickly, before we jump into the Overlake reverse pitches, I wanted to give a quick overview of the program. So the Elevar Labs program is structured as a competition where startups compete to land a transformative revenue generating contract with Enterprise, in this case with Overlake. And the program is really structured to bring benefits to not only the Enterprise, but also to all startups that participate, including those startups that don't necessarily win. Now, from the enterprise perspective, there's the obvious benefit of gaining access to an innovative solution. But what's more important here is that Overlake is looking for a solution that is specifically customized and tailored to needs that you're going to hear pitched by the executives today. And from the startup perspective, 
I saw a lot of you are new here, and I'm going to assume that many of you are startups. So speaking directly to you, the benefit of going through this program is that not only do you get to have the potential to win a revenue generating contract, but you're actually gaining insider knowledge from executives that have decades of experience as to what the actual needs in the market are. Because the needs that Overlake is pitching here today are not unique to Overlake. They are endemic throughout the industry. Pretty much every provider in the United States today has the same problems that you're going to hear pitched out. So it's a really unique opportunity in that sense. But more specifically for the startup or startups that win the competition, they also get the benefit of the cachet that comes along with working with a large enterprise and being able to take that information, that proof of concept, and the data that come from the pilot to other enterprises to potentially sell during the business development efforts, but also to venture capitalists, uh, like Michael will hear from later today, to prove that their solution is gaining traction within the market. Now, jumping into the program specifics, we've broken it out into three major events. The first of which is Reverse Pitch Day, which you're all here today to learn from Overlake executives as to what the specific needs are. And after the pitches, we'll actually open up the application process for the next three weeks. So today through September 15th, all startups are able to apply online. And once the application period ends, we will begin with the Overlake team actually vetting the startups and trying to determine which solutions most adequately meet the needs that are pitched out. Now, if your solution is selected, we will invite you into the next event, which we've dubbed Enterprise Challenge Day. And it kind of works like speed dating. And I know it's a dated term, but for those of you that don't know the speed dating model, basically, you as a startup would be able to come here and meet with a panel of executives one-on-one. -on -one. And these executives will represent a vast, um, a vast a range of all of the positions within Overlake system. So you'll see folks from IT, you'll see folks from operations, the clinical aspect, marketing, et cetera. So you're able to get a diverse perspective on what the actual need is from every uh, perspective within Overlake. At the end of Enterprise Challenge Day, Overlake will determine which startups they'd like to invite back. And if you're invited back for the final day, um, that is what we've dubbed LOI Day, LOI standing for Letter of Intent. Now, startups that are invited to this, effectively, this works like Shark Tank. For those of you that haven't seen Shark Tank, you as a startup get to get up in front of a board of executives and pitch your solution to their need. And they get to grill you for 10 to 15 minutes with a whole slew of questions. And depending on how well you answer those questions, Overlake will determine which startup they want to partner with long term. Any questions about the program before I hand it over to the Overlake executives? OK. So real quick, um, the executives that are going to be presenting the problems are Dr. Dave Knopfler, um, who's the CMO at Overlake Medical Center, and Dr. Dennis Rochier. CEO of Overlake Medical Clinic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do I need a mic? I will give you a mic. Everyone here? Great. Thank you for being here. I, I can't tell you how exciting this is for us. I mean, uh, we as an institution um, are famous for deliberation, but when our strategy group came and, and brought us this idea that we could do a reverse pitch, there was no deliberation. We said, this is something we really want to do. This is exciting. Um, it is moving us into uh, the areas of technology that we want to be in. As you're all aware, we're on the east side, which is clearly is a rather famous technological hub. And we need to meet the demands of our patients and our providers um, in that process. So let me move forward. Um, I'll try here. I will attempt to move us forward. All right. Technologically savvy <laughs> physician. Uh, ah, it's not me. 
<laughs> okay. All right. So um, we'll do a little overview of Overlake over here. Let me get out of the way. Um, we're uh, a community hospital, and, and we're very proud of that fact. Our, our mission is to serve our community. We're not for profit. We actually don't take levy money either. So some of our neighbors um, do collect property tax and help support themselves, but we don't do that. So the concept began in 52. I'm going to do this fast. In 1960, the hospital opened, small hospital on the east side. Um, we have progressed rapidly in 2007. We opened up our five-story South Tower. Um, great, thank you. And um, we also have a very um, uh, a wonderful heart and vascular center that we are very proud of and we feel offers some of the most cutting-edge therapies. Uh, we also have a neuroscience institute that opened up uh, just last year. We have a total of 349 beds. That puts us in kind of the medium-sized hospital range. Um, we directly employ over 120 providers. And right now on the east side, there's about a million residents. So we have a very large service area. The last thing I'll say, which is on here, is we actually have over 1,000 providers. So over 1,000 uh, physicians, actually about 1,200 providers when you throw in the <laughs> mid-levels. So we have a very sizable um, population that we serve as well as um, uh, providers. What do we do? Um, I'm not going to read all these numbers. Um, they're, they're, we're very proud of it. We work very hard to uh, stay busy and provide absolutely the, the highest quality and safest care. Um, I'll let you look at those and we'll move on here. Um, a couple things I'd like to point out. You can't do healthcare these days unless you're focused on quality and safety. And that, that is mission number one. Uh, we um, are very proud of our LeapFrog uh, rating. Uh, an A rating is something that's very hard to get. Uh, they do a survey twice a year. We have over three years now, we actually have seven surveys, I believe, um, where we've gotten that A rating. That's one of only eight hospitals in the state and the only one on the east side. You know, there's a lot of other rating agencies. There's health grades and U.S. News, and we, we do very well with all of those. Um, Joint Commission is an accreditation agency. Um, we're only one of about 700 hospitals in the nation that are listed as a top performer. Other things, we're a level three trauma center. We're actually Harborview's backup. Should Harborview collapse or the big, the big one strike, um, we're the backup for them on the east side. We have a level three NICU. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, very advanced cardiac program, which includes cardiac surgery, structural heart, uh, electrophysiology, which is advanced diagnosis of electrical conditions of the heart and treatment. We do a lot of arrhythmia work. Um, we have an advanced neurosciences program. It covers all areas. Uh, one thing we do, which many don't, is uh, called endovascular neurosurgery. So it's actually putting catheters in the brain to uh, take care of stroke and other conditions. And then last, um, we have a wide variety of uh, subspecialty medical and surgical programs. And, and we feel that we need this to be the community hospital for the east side. This is, this is part of our mission. The clinics are, are an essential part of uh, what a system is. Um, in 2015, our primary care and urgent care centers took care of over 190,000 visits. If you think that's a lot, it is. Um, we served over 45 unique 45,000 patients in our three urgent care uh, locations. We're opening up a fourth urgent care uh, location uh, right now up in the Lake Hills neighborhood. Um, the urgent care clinics are open some six, some seven days a week with extended and after hours. You can see there's a good wide uh, geographic uh, dispersion throughout the east side to make sure that we're covering all of our patient needs. So uh, I'm going to hand off here in just a second. We're going to do our two statements. The first will be uh, presented by Dennis Rochier, who's our physician and CEO of our clinic system. And then you'll get me again for problem statement number two. So I'm going to pass off to Dennis. It works. I'll try not to break it. Just as a heads up, we're going to open up uh, the floor to questions um, at the end of each problem statement. So if you can just hold your questions till the end, uh, we'll open up the floor for that. Good. So my name is Dennis Rochier. As you heard, I'm a primary care physician. I see a lot of Overlake people here in the audience tonight, and I'm very disappointed about that. I was hoping to have a room full of total strangers <laughs> that I would never have to face again. <laughs> so my background is primary care, uh, and I love the U.S. healthcare system. I've worked in it for three decades, and I love it because it's a system that's designed entirely around me, the doctor. <laughs> So if you're sick and you need me, I'm there for you. As long as you need me, 
Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday between 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. <laughs> or between the hours of 1 and 3.30 unless it's a major holiday, minor holiday, observance, Bastille Day, or one of my children's birthdays, in which case I will close. It wasn't always that way, however. When I was growing up in a small town in Texas, if I was sick and my parents wanted to take me to a doctor, they would take me to this small clinic that was staffed by a couple of family medicine docs. That clinic was open all the time. They were work hardworking doctors. My parents would take me right in and we would wait. And we would wait until we could be seen. Didn't matter what day of the week it was. There was no day that we didn't have to wait. There was no time that we could go in that we didn't have to wait. So as healthcare has progressed, we've developed a new innovative approach to healthcare delivery. It's called urgent care. Urgent care is a clinic that's open for long hours. It's staffed by usually a couple of family medicine doctors and you can go in anytime you want and you can wait. <laughs> so things seem to be coming back around again and I don't know why we can't use our technology to fix this problem, to do away with the waits, to match up the demand of our patients with our capacity to provide the care to those patients. All we've done with our technology is create fancy schedules using spreadsheets and with a single, a few keystrokes, I can wipe out entire hours of my availability. <laughs> so here's the problem statement spelled out for you. What tools and technologies can Overlake use to improve patient access to care? Let me, uh, let me spell this out by telling a story. It's a story I call A Tale of Two Saturdays. So on the first Saturday, you get up, you get to go to a big wedding that night. It's a, not your wedding, it's not that big, but it's a wedding of a close friend. There's gonna be a couple of hundred people there. You look in the mirror and you realize that you really need to get a haircut before you go to this wedding. You know that you need a haircut because you're looking at a straight frontal view and you can see your neck hair. So. <laughs> You reach into your pocket and you whip out your smartphone and you open up your Spiffy Cuts app and you click on it and you see that there are no less than four Spiffy Cuts within a 15 minute drive of your present location. Each of those Spiffy Cuts displays on your screen how many minutes the current wait time is. You see one that only has a 15 minute wait, you calculate your drive time, you punch on that, you're in line. You drive over, you walk in, you get your hair cut, you go about your day, right? Now, let's take another Saturday. You wake up, you're gonna to go to a big wedding that night. It's an important wedding, it's not your wedding, but a lot of people will be there. You look in the mirror, and you see these strange spots, blotchy marks on your face, and you start feeling a little feverish and a little scratchiness in your throat. You wanna to go to the wedding, but you don't wanna be the index case for the next worldwide pandemic of avian flu. So you think, maybe I should get checked out at my nearby Overlake Urgent Care. Overlake is on my health plan, they're in my network. I like them, they have good doctors. So, can you call and get an appointment? No, you can't, because Urgent Care, although they're open long hours and they're convenient, they don't take appointments. Can you get in line electronically? No, you can't, because they don't have an app. So you drive to the closest one, you walk in, and the room is full of people with similar rashes and you start worrying, this is really gonna be bad, there's something going on here. They tell you it's a two hour wait. You say, oh God, I can't wait two hours, I have things to do, I got this big wedding to go to, I feel okay, I just don't wanna start an epidemic, can't somebody see me? Well, maybe you are so persistent you cajole the front office person to actually get on the phone and call to the nearest other urgent care center and you're told good news. There's only one person in the waiting room over there. So you get in your car, you drive across town to the urg other urgent care, and just as you're pulling into the parking lot, a school bus pulls in with 13 junior high school soccer team girls, and in their right hand, they have their sports physical form, and in their left hand, they have 35 grubby $1 bills. It's now a two and a half hour wait. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? The problem is that our clinics can't tell you when there's availability, they can't even tell each other because by the time you get in your car and go from A to B, the situation has changed and there's no way in real time for them to know. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? You can do this with your hair, but you can't do this with your body. So I want you to understand that this is something we would like to apply primarily in our urgent care settings, but maybe it could be scaled. Maybe we could use it in our primary care clinics. Maybe 
if you knew you could go into a primary care doctor anytime you wanted and be seen in a reasonable amount of time, you wouldn't make that appointment three months in advance only to be called one week before your appointment and find out that your doctor has decided to go on a vacation and now you have to reschedule. You wouldn't have to schedule any appointments. You would just go in. I mean, look, you don't make an appointment to go to the grocery store to buy a can of beans. You decide you need some beans, you get in your car, you go to the store, you go to the bean aisle, there they are, right? Now, I realize that healthcare is not a can of beans, but doesn't it seem there should be some way for you to know when you can get what you need without having to go through this, all this rigmarole? I'm sure you've all been through it, right? You've all done this. You've all had to play this game with us. So let's look at what people want when they're going to an urgent care. First of all, they actually want us. They want to go to a hospital-owned or hospital-affiliated urgent care. 70% of people have a slight or strong preference for that. Most people don't want to go to the independent urgent care clinics, the little, uh, the little convenient care clinics that you find in the drug stores, right? But they'll go there if they have to. So they want to come to us. We want them to come to us. We want to take care of them, but we can't seem to figure out how to do that in a way that's convenient, as convenient as buying a can of beans at the grocery store. Now, if you ask for the top 10 reasons that people choose a specific primary care, they say, I want to be able to walk in without an appointment. But they can't do that, because if you want to see me in my primary care clinic, you need an appointment, because the system is built around me, remember? That's what I like about it. They want to be able to get their labs and x-rays done at the clinic, which we offer. We can do that at our urgent care clinics. We can get imaging, and we can get labs done. You want to make sure that we're in network, and we are. We're, in most of the, we're on most of the health plans, all the major health plans. We're a preferred provider for you, especially if you live in our area. So we can actually, it's, it's one, two, three, we got it. This visit will be free, sorry, can't quite go there. But if we're on your plan, it may not be too expensive. It may be not free, but reasonable. We want healthcare to be reasonably priced for our customers. So we, we have this part. We have the part where we're preferred by our customers as a choice of urgent cares. We just don't have the part where we can match things up. And the other thing that would be great when you tech people are making up this technology to solve this problem for me is if you include the ability for me to track metadata. I want to know when are there surges, when are there ebbs, how can I staff appropriately. The most expensive asset I have in my clinics is my human capital. Now, you know healthcare is expensive, but what you may not know is the margins are very, very thin. And if I spend money staffing a clinic that's empty, I don't have a margin. I just blew it all. And if I don't staff a clinic and I have people who are in the waiting room who get tired of waiting and they walk out, then I've also made a bad business decision. So I would like to have something, when you're designing this technology for us, something that allows us to study our population and understand how things flow. How can we make our demand match up with our capacity? Because right now, what we try to do is we try to force the demand into whatever capacity we decide to give them. So we want to do it the other way around. Measure the demand first, build the capacity to meet that. So those are your, that's your objectives. So to put it in a few bullet points, and this is my last slide, how can we make it easy to find a same-day appointment, maybe even get rid of appointments altogether, uh, how can we provide information on the weights for people who want to come to urgent care so you know what you're getting into before you get into it? How can you use your phone or some other technology? You could use your PC, or maybe you could use your smart television now. Um, how can we collect timely uh, data so that we know how to staff in the future? Because there will be some seasonality. There will be some kind of rhythm to this based on times of day. I bet you anything there's a big surge every day when, when school gets out. That's just a guess on my part. But there might not be. I don't know. I don't have any way of knowing if that's true. Um, and then how can I use this information to better staff my clinics with the right people so I'm not wasting valuable resources when I don't need to? All right? Questions? All right, we're going to open it up. You guys got it all figured out already, right? Somebody has this solved. They just, yes. About five minutes for questions, and please wait and let us bring the mics around to you. Are you integrating this with Epic's appointment scheduler? Your I'm glad you frame? asked that because this is an important requirement. We don't want to have our operators having to work in two separate platforms. 
So we would want something that somehow talks to Epic at the very least that knows what's going to Epic is our electronic health record. Uh, we have a scheduling uh, a part of that that's called cadence that helps us know what the flow is. So even though people come into our urgent cares without an appointment, when they come in, we, we put them in. We put them in as a, as a patient so that we know who's next in line. So you're able to extract data from that being... Well, we can't right now. Okay. But sometimes the knowledge they, base does come from Epic. Yeah, this isn't, that's not enough. I want more. Right. Okay. But what I'm getting at is, but that's where the basic knowledge is coming from all different areas into one central database to be able to pull from, correct? Yeah, yeah. We want to be able to work in one. We want to, as, as, as much as it's possible, we don't want to have to deal with multiple platforms. We want everything one-stop shopping for our operators. And it would be great if an operator at one point could know what was happening to an operator at another point position uh, I don't know the answer to that question we have another question in the back here thanks I, I was just wondering if have you ever asked your uh, patients what do they want I mean when I go to my primary care doc all I care for is if, if they can spend a minute asking me about my frustration and start to compile that sort of a data but they never care to do so we've been asking patients what they want for decades and and we we just don't listen to the answer because what they want <laughs> What they want was in that previous slide that said they want to go to a place that is on their health plan, that's in their network, that they can walk in without having to plan way ahead, that they can get a same day appointment without having to wait forever, and uh, that's free. That's what they want. So we do ask people what they want, and we send out surveys. We survey people like, like nothing you've ever, we do more surveys than any, probably any other industry, and we compile massive amounts of survey responses and then we don't know what to do with it. A question over here. Okay. Have you considered any telehealth, telemedicine? So tel telemedicine is something that's already out there. That's not anything new. People can use telemedicine. I used to be a telemedicine physician when I was living in Reno, Nevada. I was the director of telemedicine. And the one thing I did like about telemedicine is I was always on time because the appointment started at 10 o'clock and then at 10.20, it went to another city. And so the patients knew they only had 20 minutes. But this problem we're presenting to you today is not about physician workflow. It's about patient access. So don't confuse the two. OK. Over here. So I'm an overly uh -oh, person. It's a plant. It's a plant. I, I won't uh, ask a question, but I'll say very briefly the idea of knowing the wait time at different places. A lot of places do that. Our ER does that, right? Are we doing that in the ED? Not now? Okay. They do so, it at the airport. A lot, well, a, lot of, a lot of hospitals will display their current wait time in their ED, for example. What I've never seen, though, is a hospital that says how busy you might expect it to be later this afternoon. So you could look and you could see that it's 20 minutes or an hour right now. The next question you have is, well, what if I wait and go two hours later? Is it likely to be better? Or what about this it, idea? I it like could be like a mapping What if I look and I say, okay, the wait time's an hour. Fine. I've got other things to do. Put me in line. Then 15 yeah, minutes too. before my hour is up, I get a text message that says, get over here, your hour's about gone, and I've been in line a whole time, but I've been in line while I'm shopping for beans. Okay, it's gonna be one more question over here. So how far out would you want the ability for a patient to schedule at a point where, I mean, I could see this where, you could make it for urgent, but you could also say, I want to schedule something three weeks from now, and I know it's booked, and I don't even have to interact with somebody at your front desk. We don't want people to schedule. We want people to come in when they want to be seen and to be able to be seen when they want to come in. So it's not a, but we can do that. We already are really good at scheduling stuff. We're great at scheduling people, and then we're great at rescheduling them when we change our minds. <laughs> so I don't need scheduling. I need access. Don't confuse access and scheduling. Scheduling is the opposite of access. In true access, you walk in when you want to walk in and you get seen. In scheduling, you tell them when you want to be seen, you show up on time, and then they don't see you. <laughs> Molly, do we have any questions from the interwebs? Okay. Okay. Oh, I don't know how much time I'm allowed. Gonna be the last question. What's your budget? Uh, what, I don't know my budget. What is our budget? Who's got, my, who's got the checkbook? <laughs> Honestly, don't know. They didn't tell us that. The, the budget's really going to depend on the... Questions, what's your proposal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Free. Yeah. Free. I like free. <laughs> hey, if this works, you don't need to make any money off of us. You can make a fortune selling this to our competitors. 
All right? So are, we're good. OK, so I'm going to now, I'm going to hand it back over to Dave, who's going to tell you what problem number two is. And then you can decide if you want to tackle problem number one or if you want to tackle problem number two. I don't recommend you try to tackle both problems. I think that would be way too difficult to do both. Right. I agree. All right, so, so uh, you just got the softball. I'm going to give you the hardball. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So again, what solutions or technologies can help patients navig navigate the Overlake system? OK, keyword, navigate. Um, how many people here have been hospitalized? Be brave, okay. How many felt that that was a really clear process? Let's talk insurance, let's talk co-pays, let's talk moving data around. We have, it was in Ireland. It was in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm moving, all right. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, we all know, especially anyone who's been hospitalized or been through a complex process in clinics, this is a very, very confusing complex system, expensive if you do it wrong, if somebody's not on your plan and you see them. I mean, this is really a big challenge. We, we really look to break this down into three areas for us, three areas that are really crucial when it comes to navigation. So there's sort of the economic domain, uh, which includes things like insurance, payment, and billing questions. Those are simple logistical areas. How do referrals get passed on? I know that sounds really simple, and we'll touch on the epic thing here in a second testing authorizations, medical records, all of this data, right? There's all this data that resides in different places. Let's throw in the cultural complexities that exist these days. Th there's an amazingly diverse population. I mentioned at the outset the fact that we have over 60 languages that we're, we're, took care of at Overlake Hospital. Everyone love a spaghetti diagram? Yeah, all right. So th this is simply illustrative, but this is what a patient faces. And you know, the real challenge here is that when you're a patient, you're often at, at the most vulnerable time, right? You're, you're sick, you're ill, you're needing care, you're having behavioral or mental health challenges. These are times when all of a sudden you're faced with some of the most complex decision making that you have. In fact, it's so complex, there's now actually something called a patient navigator. This is a human being that there's true certification for you. You can go to a class and become certified as a patient navigator. In the past, it was often a family member or a friend that did this. The complexity of the system has, has moved beyond that in a lot of cases. And especially as you get into the most complex cases, you know, oncology, cancer, the decisions that need to be made, the, the places you need to go, get it, it's very confusing. It can be very overwhelming. The cultural piece I'm gonna to touch on a little bit more. Um, and Overlake Hospital, this is just one example. So in, in our um, east side location, one third of our households speak a language other than English at home. Our interpreter services, we had 13,000 in-person uh, translation processes that went on. We had s over 7,000 video or phone translation processes. And our interpretive services handled over 60 languages last year. This is on the east side. Very complicated. Let me spend a second talking about a typical experience. So I'm going to use a middle-aged male physician, might be me, who was walking down his stairs and tried to not step on his cat. He didn't, <laughs> but he also did a header down the stairs. So, um, you know, and, and this person's a pretty sophisticated healthcare user. So this person goes to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my slide here. But this person, you know, they go to their primary care physician. They say, well, let's try a little conservative therapy. Yeah, your knee hurts, but, you know, I don't think you did any real damage. You do some rest and some ice and some elevation, and you take your anti-inflammatories, and you wait a couple weeks, and you go, I can't walk. You go back to your primary care physician, he said, maybe I'll refer you to the specialist now. So you go to see the specialist. Special we need to do some tests. We need some x-rays, and then we need to do an MRI. You go have those done, another week passes. You go back to your specialist, they say, yep, you, you tore your medial meniscus. Might get better, it might not. You do some more conservative therapy, it doesn't work. You go back to the specialist. You say, okay, we're gonna have to do surgery. You've, you've, it's now been three months. You've got data all over, 
residing everywhere. You've got some imaging data, you've got pharmacy data, you've got data at your primary care physician, you've got data at your specialist. How does that all come together? The real key here is that the insurance is at the center of a lot of this. And one of the challenges that we face is that as I move, or the physician or the, the patient move from primary care to specialist, referral required. When the specialist wants to get the MRI done, referral required. Information about the conservative therapy, how much conservative therapy was done, information required at the, at the level of the insurer. So all of these things feed into to a central repository around the insurer. And moving that data in the past involved everything from faxes to phones to literally the patient, and maybe some of you have done this, carried papers, x-rays, whatever information had to go, you carried it from one place to another. So very complex system. So we came up the, with the idea of an electronic concierge. So there was a patient concierge. So what we thought is, could there be systems? Could there be something that helps with the movement of this data? And you know, Epic was brought up in the, in the last discussion as well. Some of this data resides in Epic, sure. At the primary care physician, but in my case, or this patient's case, not at the specialist. The labs were done elsewhere. The imaging was done elsewhere. So we have data scattered around. So as we look through our needs as an institution and to serve our patients, how can this electronic concierge just even establish a base understanding or help guide patients through the billing insurance processes? How can we create a process for expeditious insurance authorizations and approvals? That's about data. So that's about making sure that the required data ends up at the insurer to get it approved. How do we use tools that we're all familiar with, like smartphones, to convey the information back and forth? How does the patient know at what stage the process is? The insurance has approved it, or it hasn't approved it, or it's missing a piece of information. How do, how do we centralize that process? How do we integrate the medical record accessibility? So in our case, how do we get Epic records out to the various providers? How do we get that data out to the insurer? And then lastly, how do we do all of this in the preferred language of the patient? So as I said, this, this is the tough one. This is a biggie. This is the future of healthcare, though. This is about interoperability. This is about integration. And, and I think, unfortunately, um, it's going to take some stepwise work to get there. But I think someone who's first at doing this kind of integration or does it really well, even if they're not first, has a tremendous advantage. All right, that's a complex topic. I would think electronic concierge, if you're walking away from here, if we can do all of it, great. If we can do part of it, that may be the answer. So we have five minutes for questions. Again, please wait for the mic to come to you. And for those watching on the live stream, feel free to submit your questions and we can ask them live as well. I saw a couple hands. Hi, so for this challenge and actually the other challenge as well, uh, do you have any access to, you know, because I heard about, you know, um, Epic, stuff like that, do we have any access to do uh, documentation, data sets, APIs for this challenge? Yeah, so, so Epic does make APIs available. Um, it would take work with Epic to, to do that. With, we have an Epic team internally, but it would also take work with the vendor themselves, uh, but they do make APIs available for movement of data. There are obviously other systems out there as well that, um, have that availability. Do you get most of this information from mm -hmm. your um, EDI, your communication with your insurance companies currently for the EOBs? Um, you know, it's a mixed bag. I mean, it depends. Our, if, if you're talking internal to, to our system, yes. You know, we're, we're an institution that has the vast majority of our providers as independents in the community. So um, we, we still rely on a lot of very manual movement of data um, with those external and independent practices and even, you know, maybe the radiology group um, or if you have lab testing. Um, so it's, again, we're talking a higher level integration here. One way over here. Over here. This way. So is there a particular condition that you would pick as kind of a focal first effort? You mentioned oncology. Would it be joint replacement? Would it be like what, what 
comes to mind for you guys about if we could solve this mm -hmm. navigator problem right. for this population, that would be generalizable? It's a great question. I'm not sure I'm going to answer that with a specific one. I will turn it around, though, and say if you, if you come back, if someone came back with a specific area, that uh, we wouldn't rule it out because it's a specific area. I think we'd be very open to saying, let's start this in this particular field, oncology, orthopedics, something as a, as a beginning to the process. I think that's very reasonable. Are the workflows themselves pretty well defined? Is the problem that the workflows have to be defined, or is the problem they have to be communicated to the patients? You know, it's a it's a great question. You know, overall the workflow flows are reasonably well defined. I mean, there's there's a fair amount of predictability in terms of based on a specific insurer exactly what the process is. So you could literally say, for insurer A. You know, this is the process that's required to get approval for this specific test procedure. Insure B, it, it's actually well defined. Um, so it would take some work as well in that, in that arena to understand for a given procedure what the requirements are with each insurer. But yeah, it's not, it's not a crapshoot by any means. I mean, there's a, there typically is very well defined requirements. Over in the cheap seats. <laughs> I think one of the distinctions here that we're talking about, though, is that we're talking about this from a payer-centric perspective. So the process is fairly clear between the provider of care and the insurance company, but the provider of care may vary across all of these different settings, and the patient is blind to the interactions, which bill gets there first, which gets paid first which network, which tier, all those different things are invisible to the patient. So the solution we're looking for is one that helps our patients understand that across a myriad of settings and or potentially payers and providers of care. Very well said, thank you. That's one of our wonderful Overlake uh, uh, directors. Hi, what would be the top three KPIs you will measure to say that this is wow. a success? Wow, great question. I have to admit, I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't actually thought about that. I mean, I think initially it's going to be very, very, um, I hate to say this, subjective in that it's going to be patient-focused. So I think it, they're likely to be focused around the patient and what their perception is of um, the ease of transitions of care, how well the data moved. I think it's, so it's a little squishy at first. I think, you know, after you go through round one, you could probably start looking at things that are a little more objective. But I'm going to have to say initially, it's about the patient experience, probably. Yeah, I mean, you could look at things like in, in the outpatient environment, CG caps, or in the inpatient environment, age caps. That might be one. But I, I think you'd actually want to develop a separate sort of survey process for this because you're really gauging something a little different. I think you would use those as well. But uh, I think we, we as an institution would want to do something very specific to patients who are part of that to really uh, understand their experience and also, I mean, to improve it, but also to understand whether it's meeting the intended goals. One more. In the scenario you described with the person with the knee issue, yeah. how likely is it that all of the people that they see are gonna be within the Overlake community versus are they seeing outside providers? So does this need to be something that integrates all providers or just specific to Overlake? Yeah, we're looking for all providers. So within the Overlake, what I'll call the Overlake community, and by that I'm, what I'm meaning is our clinic system, we're all on Epic. There's, there's a better flow of data within that. However, we still have issues, we can have issues with radiology, uh, typically not with labs, but we're really looking for a community solution. So it would be how do we get um, orthopedist A to be part of this? How do we get imaging center B to be part of this as well. So it's a complex problem. There's no question about it because they're obviously on different systems. T almost always we're talking about a myriad of systems that they're using. Okay, we have time for one more question. Population health, are you part of an ACO? We are. So wouldn't a lot of this come from the software that they have? to roll up through the community? So there's very little software that addresses ACOs. 
So in other words, population health, which is a great term, which we all, most of us who are in healthcare understand very, very well what that means. The tools to assist in population health are infancy. Um, they're, they're not robust. Uh, I will tell you that most of the ACO reporting that's done right now, the data comes in in an Excel spreadsheet and it's manually validated, managed, and processed. There's software for that. <laughs> no follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there is software out there. The, the, key, you know, the, the challenge is integration. What you find is that most, uh, at least in the Northwest, we aren't at a place where typically any of the um, major systems or uh, uh, hospitals have really um, capitalized on what's out there. That's a fair way to put it. All right, great. And with that, I would like to just thank Dr. Knopfler and Dr. Rochier. Well done, and, and entertaining. We are going to take a five minute break, so if anyone wants to grab a bite to eat or uh, freshen up your beverage or uh, take a bio break, we are gonna come right back and start our panel discussion um, five minutes sharp.
Long time. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you in person. Meet you. You guys don't want the thing in your eyes? You can move your seats forward. Yeah, there. That might help. Yeah. I don't want to be so little bit more. Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you as well. You might be so little more. Nice to see you right in your eyes. How's that? Is that better? Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Can I stay? Can we just switch off? Oh, no, we're going to have their profiles in the back. We can just put them there. Like, move them here? Or we can just move them up a little bit more. It's still, like maybe like move your chair right here. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Which, what? Like, I'm not going to study the theater side. Sorry, Steve, do you want to move this a little bit yeah. forward? Like, move your chair like right here. Yeah. It's better, it's better. Yeah, you definitely have the nerdiest background. Right? All right, if everyone can start <laughs> making their ways back to their seats, we are going to start the panel momentarily. Casey, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I'm going to be facil yeah, I'm gonna be for facilitating Alibon. the panel. Great. I'm awesome. going to be grilling you. I met your other colleagues before. Very nice to meet oh, you. Oh, great. Great. Good to meet you, too. Thank you. Kind of welcome this person. That's about it. Casey, I don't know if he told you or not, but I, I normally don't sound like this, but I'm struggling a little bit with laryngitis, so I apologize. Oh, I'll, I'll do I'll be okay, but I just want to let you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't sound like this. Oh, normal. I sound great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not going to run the mic, but I'll facilitate it. Okay. Well, Someone do you need a mic runner is the question. I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Oftar can help, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. We'll do you have enough mics? It. You just have one mic. We have two. We'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that we have a mic so we get everything captured. Yeah. 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 Everyone, go ahead and take a seat. We are going to start right now. Like, seriously, right now. You gotta move them because you're not in camera. Okay. So, actually, um, Mike, can you come sit here, please? Good spot right here. <laughs> you earned it. I don't even need to be it. in the camera. It's all about you guys. I ain't driving. I like the sound of wine bottles popping. Yeah, we need to move back a little bit because otherwise we can't see you. Okay. So if you guys. Yeah. We should have tested this beforehand. Next time. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You good? Room? Testing. Can you guys hear me? All right. Well, um, that was an exciting reverse pitch by the executives from Overlake, so thank you again. Um, and to end the evening, we're going to have a robust discussion about um, the title of the panel discussion is Dancing with Mice and Elephants. And it's about bridging the divide between enterprise and entrepreneurs. And one of the things that we've noticed as we've worked in this type of environment trying to bring innovation into large enterprises is that there is an inherent catch-22 with large enterprises leading companies that really want to innovate and bring new um, solutions to their patients or to their members or to their customers, but there is uh, an inherent risk in doing that. And so large enterprises are typically unsure of how to mitigate those risks and de-risk the innovation process. And so part of what we're doing here with Cambia and with Elevar is trying to create programs and a, and a solution and a process to bring innovation into enterprise while de-risking that whole process. Um, so with us today, we have three prominent guests um, that we're 
we're going to be having kick off this discussion and dig a little bit deeper into that topic to see how we can better bridge the divide between new innovative solutions and existing leading companies. So without further ado, I will introduce the panel. And I'm going to start in the middle here with um, Tom DeBoard. He is the Chief Operating Officer at Overlake Hospital. And he's been with Overlake since 2015. And before that, he most recently served as president of SUMA, Barberton, and Watson Rittman Hospitals in Akron, Ohio. Um, and at that hospital, as well as the Overlake Hospital, he led the day-to-day -day operations. So thank you, Tom, for being with us. And then I'm going to move to his left, um, Steve Schwartz, who's the SVP of Strategy and Corporate Development at Healthways. And at Healthways, he develops the corporate and business unit strategies, partnerships, and M&A activity. And he has more than 25 years of experience in building high growth companies, of which include 23andMe, a Silicon Valley based company that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, as well as Allscripts. So thank you, Steve, for being here. And then last but not least, we have Michael Carney, who comes uh, to the Pacific Northwest all the way from Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Direct flight. Um, and he is an investor at Upfront Ventures, which is a venture capital firm. Um, and he specializes in digital health, as well as other areas, including retail, financial services, and B2B software. Thank you for joining us. He specializes is an exaggeration. I am interested in digital health. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll plead ignorance sitting next to guys like these. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks. Great. So um, I wanted to start off with a question for, for all of you, and maybe, Tom, you can kind of kick it off for, for us. Um, why, why is it so hard to bring innovation into large healthcare companies? Well, for... Is this on? Uh, not, there you go. Now, now it's on. You can hear me now? Okay. I apologize for my voice. I don't always sound like this. Uh, but of course, now I'm speaking in front of a crowd, so I have laryngitis. Um, the reason it's difficult, and Chris really kind of alluded to it, Chris, yeah, it's not a cold. Uh, it's not contagious, but if we had an app, we could figure that out probably. Um, but uh, as Chris kind of alluded to it in his introductory comments earlier. Um, healthcare organizations, hospitals, and I'm, I'm really going to speak from really a community hospital. Overlake is an independent community hospital, medium size. We're not a big system like Providence, like Catholic Health Initiatives, like multi-care and some of the other big systems out there, uh, but yet we're providing a lot of high-end, very advanced care on the east side, uh, and there's lots of competing priorities, right? So innovation is something we really are interested in. We're really excited to be here today because of that. And part of the reason why we're here today is we don't have the ability to create a $150 million budget for innovation like a Providence can do or Intermountain Health can do, or Cleveland Clinic back in Ohio where I came from does a lot of innovative. They have their Cleveland Clinic Innovation Institute. Um, we don't have that ability. So this opportunity for us to come together with startup companies, groups like Cambia Grove and Elevar and others that can help match us up and really enable us to kind of get started with it is the way we can do it. We have competing priorities around budgets. Um, is I think our uh, uh, host comedian and uh, expert from our Overlake Medical <laughs> Clinics, Dr. Rochier, told us, um, you know, we, we live on low margins. You know, we generate a lot of revenues. I know everybody looks at their bills. We don't get paid based on what's on those bills, but we do generate a lot of revenues. Uh, but yet there's a lot of cost. I mean, 65% of our cost are just related to the staff that we have to provide. And of course, nobody thinks we have enough staff. So it's balancing those revenues coming in with the staff that we have to put out there and then all the other expenses to run it. So we're running on really fairly thin margins. So to be able to invest a lot of money in innovative solutions that we want and need really just aren't possible. So it's like competing priorities to add new staff, to put new clinics in the neighborhoods that the people want, to be able to buy the new CAT scan, to buy the new uh, patient beds, to buy the sofa bed that the father of the mother who's getting ready to deliver wants to be able to be in, in the room. And you start adding all of those things up, and those take away in our priorities, because everything we do every day is around the patient. So that's probably one of the biggest reasons why it's hard. And then the other thing he also alluded to is that, generally speaking, 
we're really risk averse, right? So in healthcare, um, we don't have the choice or we don't have the chance to do all these innovative things and make a bunch of mistakes because it can impact patient care. It can impact patient's health. It could actually hurt somebody, which is what we're trying to avoid doing. So those are probably the two biggest, in my mind, reasons for why it's really difficult. Thank you. And, um, Steve, from your perspective as a you know, exec executive and helping small companies grow into large companies, um, where do you see the challenge in getting into big companies um, and enterprise sales? Um, I think it's, it's important if you're a small company to um, not try to do everything yourself. Even as a small company, you can get the attention of a partner who has a relationship with an enterprise, who has been through the ropes there before, and you can short circuit a lot of the challenges that you won't anticipate. Like, you know, when you go into an em enterprise, there's going to be a security audit, and there's going to be a HIPAA audit, and there's going to be a network uh, um, uh, audit of some sort. All these things that y you'll you'll anticipate some of it, but not all of it, and and so. Teaming up with someone who's a bit more experienced can can really shortcut um, some of the learnings that you'll do. Um, and from the enterprise side, you know, down to the startup, really thinking about all those things that are absolute. You got to check the checkbox firsts and get those up front and set those expectations that, you know, if you, you got to do this, 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 and this in addition to this innovation. So make sure you're planning for all this because. Um, you can't assume that a startup is going to have all the expertise and all the experience that an enterprise has, that an enterprise has to deal with, with a complex environment, with, um, you know, the patient, the insurer, all the different stakeholders that they have to manage. The startup usually is focused on one or two problems, and so you have to, you know, if you're going to work with a startup, get into their shoes a little bit and, and think about those challenges. Right. And, and Michael, um, from your perspective as an investor, when you're considering startups to invest in, how important is it to have to see a small, a small startup with enterprise traction or enterprise sales? I mean, obviously, the more traction you can have, the better. There's, there's no argument about that. We don't always say it's a prerequisite to, have, to make an investment, but we like to have some kind of indication that it's, it's possible. So if it is a, an ongoing discussion and we can talk to the kind of business unit champion within the enterprise, they can say, listen, we, we think these guys are addressing a real problem. They're not fully there yet. We haven't kind of checked all our boxes to implement it, but we think there's a real path and, and we're going to work closely with them and make sure that they're putting all, the, all the, the kind of steps in place, um, all the you know, technology requirements in place so that six months from now, they have a real shot at getting a deal with us. That gives us comfort. Uh, it lets us know that, that you know, they're, they're banging against the right door. Um, and then obviously, you know, the more traction you can have, and even better if it's, if it's paid, a paid pilot of some sort, this gives us a little bit of comfort that not only is this solving a problem, but it's one that people are willing to, to pay for, mm -hmm. um, certainly. Great. And then um, in general, I think that you know, for the entrepreneurs here and the startups here. Um, it'd be great if you could give some advice as to, from each of your perspectives, you, you know, from a VC perspective, from executive, from a successful s startup, um, where do you see most startups kind of missing the mark or, or failing when it comes to um, either messaging their, their value add or their solution or during the business development process? What sort of lessons learned or, or tips can you give to the audience? I think I'll start, if you're right. Uh, I think one of the key things, and I think it's been alluded to by a few people here today, including Chris uh, with Elevar, is really speaking the same language. I mean, you hear in the startup world things like um, move fast, break things, right? It's a cliche Mark Zuckerberg put in his, uh, his S1 statement. You know, we're going to try things, we're going to throw things out there, see what works, see what doesn't. You hear things like um, minimum viable product. We're going to put together something that kind of works and might not look that great and may have some bugs, but we're going to get it out there and get feedback. And that works when you're you know, selling a 99 cent app to a consumer who has a very low bar for, for risk. You know, there's not a lot at stake. When you're dealing with enterprise in any industry, let alone healthcare, that doesn't really work. And so proper expectations, but also just communicating really what you're going to deliver and how, how well packaged the solution is going to be before you put it into a partner's hands. I think you know, people can get turned off just by language and just by expectation setting before there's even an opportunity to try a product and see if it's a fit. Uh, and we see that a lot across industries. And from, um, 
from the hospital's perspective, um, I was going to say the same thing. It's got to be usable, right? So our healthcare providers are challenged every day. They're doing way too much paperwork. Even if it's electronic, it's still paperwork. They're checking a lot of boxes. They're moving a lot of stuff around. All of that takes time away from their patients, which is what they really want to do, what they were trained for. So the technology has to be something that really can help save time and not take away time. We can sit and talk all day long about electronic medical records, the ability for it to be safer for the patients, and there are a lot of those things that are built into those systems. The reality is electronic medical records have reduced the productivity of our staff and our physicians to a significant degree. The original thought David and I were talking about the other day was it would be like this U curve, so we knew the productivity would go down. The hope is it would come back up. What it really ended up being was a J curve, right, or J. It came up a little bit but it stopped. And so now the staff is frustrated because they're spending all the time doing this electronic or otherwise paperwork, and it's keeping them from being able to do uh, the care that they really want to give. So anything that can help bring and save time to the provider so they can spend more time with their patients is huge. Making it familiar to the provider or the, the nurse or the physician so that they understand it and it's easy to use is also critical. I would also add, uh, you know, both to the entrepreneur and the enterprise, avoid free pilots because you have to you have to get buy-in from both sides to make the investment to get it good enough to be meaningful and make a difference. And it also you have to have buy-in from the stakeholders on the enterprise side, or you're you're just not going to get the feedback you need to get it right and to eventually kind of meet in the middle and get to a place where, where something, you know, that's meaningful is achieved. Um, and, you know, that's also going to help the entrepreneur who's looking for investment dollars. Um, but, you know, you, you, it also, you know, raises the bar a bit because, you know, you know, someone is not going to pay unless you meet some minimum level of capability that gets created and, and minimum level of performance. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, are, are there any other types of arrangements or um, things that you would um, warn against or that you've seen work really well in terms of you know, free pilots or paid pilots, um, maybe some sort of equity share or investment by the enterprise company into the startup? Um, just your thoughts on that or opinions on that for all three of you. Yeah, I, you know, I, over the years I've seen a number of, of uh, different structures somewhere you know, they're given a, a really, really low price to get in the door and that they'll share revenue somehow to the next, you know, five customers within a region or, you know, sometimes they don't even think it through and they say it's, you know, for all customers in the future. And those things typically just don't work very well and uh, unless it's really well conceived, unless it's very limited, um, you know, that you'll get the revenue share on the first three customers after, or something like that. But anything that's open-ended, or you know, that's not geographically limited, or something like that, is just doomed to failure because eventually the startup won't be able to survive cutting somebody in who's not really involved in what's happening beyond that. And uh, again, establish what the value is that you're looking for. Establish together a price that you can both uh, agree to and limit the pilot. I mean, if you don't start with a pilot and you try to jump right in, that's another just, you know, recipe for lots of problems. Um, speaking uh, specific, specifically to the strategic investment uh, where the enterprise is investing in the startup, um, that can work very well and it can also be hugely problematic and, and usually the difference is clear expectation setting and roadmaps from the outset and, and very rare is, is it as clear as it seems to be today with you know, Overlake having a very clear problem set and a step-by-step a -step review and they're gonna make an investment after getting to know a company for a very long time. Uh, what we see more often is that, uh, we kind of pejoratively call it innovation theater. You know, companies wanna say they're doing innovation so they make some small bets and, and usually what it is is, is um, somebody puts some, you know, a little bit of budget aside and, and they throw some money out there and they make some promises but if the early stage businesses are relying on the support of the enterprise beyond just the dollars. If it's a true strategic partnership, you have to really make sure that the partner's bought in. You have to understand what the 
uh, competitive or anti-competitive dynamics are. So if you work with one provider, is it going to prevent you from working with their competitor or their neighbor? How, do, how does your, your investor, your strategic investor, feel about that kind of competitive dynamic? Uh, information sharing, how's that going to work? So really just um, thinking very clearly through the implications of having an honest dialogue before you get into that kind of partnership with everybody, uh, being on the same page, it can be very beneficial, but it, it needs to be well structured. Yeah, and, and from the hospital's perspective, I don't have a ton of experience working with startup companies. I mean, most of the, I mean, let's be honest, most of the vendors we're working with are established vendors. But just in general, you know, kind of just back to the theory of, you know, being not risk takers and really not having the ability for things to fail because it could have big negative impacts. So it's really those things that, you know, are going to, you know, be successful for the, from the hospital's perspective, are they going to be the things that are really, um, you know, what, a little bit more well-baked and those kind of things. And I know, again, when we're looking at the innovative type of processes that are out there, you know, a lot of it's trial, trial, fail, fail, and then boom, you find something that works. And that could work for some of our stuff, depending on what it is, some of these solutions, but a lot of it, it's not. So our, we're going to be looking for some things that are a little bit more well-baked from that standpoint once we actually want to start to implement it. Yeah, and, th and that brings up a very good point of, um, you know, there's some problems that are just not suited for new or early startups to solve. Um, they are, lend themselves more towards established vendors. Um, in your opinion, in, in, in addition to the two problem statements that were pitched tonight, what other areas are, are best suited for an innovative solution, you know, within the health, healthcare ecosystem? And this could be on the provider side or the payer side or, you know, another stakeholder within the healthcare ecosystem. You know, s something like an app. A lot of organizations are looking to solve a very specific problem by providing consumers with an app that self-contained, it can be downloaded to a device, it's not dependent upon all the, you know, in insides of the integration of, of the enterprise. Those things can be done pretty rapidly and it's generally self-contained and um, might, might be better suited for, for you know, a, a partnership with an enterprise. And, you know, from my perspective, I think a little bit for, for some of them is kind of simplistic. And I, we talk about it, you know, even just having an app on a phone where somebody that comes in our hospital can figure out how to get to the, you know, cardiologist office. It's on the fifth floor of the medical office tower, but not the fifth floor of the medical office pavilion, which just happens to be right across the street from the medical office tower and also has a fifth floor with physicians on it. And, and, and I know there's apps out there that have wayfinding and all that, but those are things that are real things that could really make a difference for our patients. And then somebody was asking questions about population health and ACOs, and there are a lot of, I think, abilities for us to take advantage of some of those. Uh, I think back to your question earlier about the ACO, is there, there are technologies out there, uh, but one thing to remember is, the contracts that we have currently under an ACO are a really small number of patients compared to our overall population, because this is just so new. So we don't have a lot of our patients that are covered under ACO products. We will eventually, but we're not there yet. And if you had to buy the Epic uh, module for population health, you'd spend more on the module than the yeah. patients you'd be covering. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, again, I think that's one, one, of the, one of the things that both parties, especially with the pitch that's happening here have to consider is you have Epic as a technology infrastructure, which is not as open as it could be to allow third parties to innovate on top of it. So the two parties together are gonna have to probably roll up your sleeves and go together to Epic and, and you know fight and scrape to get them to give you access to the APIs you're gonna need or, or whatever. So uh, there's, there's not only the we, they, but there's also collaboration that's really needed sometimes with the other vendors that you have to make it work with. Yeah, I was, to echo that point, I think, think building your solution entirely dependent on another platform that is in some ways competitive is a, is a very risky proposition. Um, so to the extent that you can be platform agnostic or can you know, work friendly with a platform but not be entirely dependent on them, that's just kind of a generally a good, a good policy. Um, in terms of areas that we're excited about, we, we're actually spending a lot of time looking at behavior change, um, you know, very kind of patient-centric behavior change, maybe through a provider system, but also just direct to consumer. So solutions like Omada Health, I think, are really fascinating, where how can we get consumers um, or patients who, you know, have a chronic disease, for example, a diabetes, obesity, something like that, to change behavior either before they get into that situation or once they've been diagnosed uh, beyond just um, prescriptive medicine, but uh, diet, uh, kind of 
holistic wellness, all those kind of solutions, whether it's a, a, an app on your phone that pings you every you know, 90 minutes and says, get up and take a walk, whether it's you know, uh, a scale that, that publishes your, your weight to a select group of friends and family who give you encouragement as you're losing. Like, all those kind of things are actually proving to be very effective, um, and, and they're, they're fascinating. I think we're just scratching the surface of, of those kind of applications. Great, and I'll ask one or two more questions and then open it up to audience Q&A, so get your questions ready. Um, just, you were speaking about collaboration, Steve, and, and there are other elements um, of a kind of a mentality shift or a culture shift. What areas, um, from a cultural standpoint, can both parties, both the entrepreneur and the enterprise, um, change in order to foster this idea of innovation? Well, typically in an enterprise, um, one, you know, a smaller community uh, setting like Overlake, um, th there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of processes that are really tri almost traditions because they've been there, they're, you know, they, they happen as a result of, you know, uh, people that have been with the organization for, for many years and they just haven't learned that you know, the culture is changing over that period of time and, and the rules and processes are changing. So um, making sure that if you're in an enterprise that you get your staff out there and um, you know, continue to get education around different things and new emerging things and you know, coming to events like this to really hear what's happening and hear you know, how change is happening that can make a real difference. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to like, you know, get rid of people after 10 years. It just means you have to make sure that everyone is continuing to you know, stay abreast of the latest technologies and changes and, and you can foster that inside the organization pretty readily. Entrepreneurs, on the other hand, typically are, you know, that's all they're about. They're all about you know, break all the rules, have no process, be creative, and you'll find the solution, which is great, but then you also have to deal with the scale. Okay, now I have to scale and I have to be a little bit disciplined and, and somebody's gonna pay for this and all these things have to you know, come into view. I think Steve, Steve makes a great point, is uh, understanding that culture, the two different groups, right? So from a healthcare perspective, he was being very political. We're very bu bureaucratic, right? We like to have committee meetings. We have to have committee meetings to schedule committee meetings. Uh, I'm not lying. Um, one of the things I learned early on when I became an administrator, uh, a conference that I was at, they were explaining the differences between administrators and physicians. And physicians are scientists, right? So they are scientists. They want to collect a bunch of facts and they want to make a decision because they got 15 more minutes and they got the next patient coming in and they need to move on. They need to make those decisions. Administrators, our DNA is different. It's just the reality of it. We want, a, we want at least three or four alternatives that we can analyze. We want to do an ROI on those three or four alternatives. And then we may ask for two or two more because we don't like the first three or four that we saw. So again, I'm being a little bit funny about it, but the reality is is that we do have a bureaucracy and folks that are gonna be working with us, I mean, it's just the reality of it. We wanna change. I think the fact that we're here is a sign that we're looking to do things differently because this is outside of our box. I'm as far removed from being anything tech as you can be, um, but at the same time, we're here because we recognize we as a hospital have to start thinking differently, looking at things differently. We wanna try to understand the world of the folks that can bring these solutions to us. So I think being able to have that dialogue, bringing folks to be able to come in and talk to us about why do you do this, how do you do this, why do you need to do that, and then for us to do that same, I think we just understand how each other tick, and then that can help us have better relationships. That's why I wanted to learn when I became a young administrator how to physician tick, how do they uh, tick, because at the end of the day, we have to be able to work together. It's all about relationships in hospital. At the end of the day, we're there to take care of the patients, but the physicians and the staff are the ones delivering that care. So building that relationships and under, understanding how each of us look at things differently is critical. Can't, can't value that enough because if you're looking at a startup company, they may have the greatest solution in the world for the problem you're trying to, trying to tackle, but if you sense they don't understand what working within an enterprise is gonna be like and they're not investing themselves to understand that, you're gonna have the same set of issues or a completely different set of issues and, and really have challenges. So you wanna make sure that culture fit or that you at least see that both sides are listening and understanding what's being said and, uh, and set, a, you know, set objectives that both sides can agree to and, and, and make sure they understand. 
Yeah, to, to expand upon that, I think when these partnerships, when we see these partnerships work well, um, it's when there is a, a mutual respect between the two parties and it, it, each party having a self-awareness of their strengths and weaknesses. So startups can be very um, overconfident in their ability to fix all of the world's problems and to presume that everybody who's been in business for more than five years is old and stupid and you know whatever. Like it, It's a well-deserved reputation. <laughs> Enterprises are famous for thinking we can do it ourselves. The you know 25 year old technology vendor we've been working with since 1987 has solved all of our problems to date. They're going to solve this problem too. Um, and I think when when enterprise and early stage work well together, it's w when they say, okay, we have a de deficit in this area. You know, we we can't move fast enough. Uh, we don't have young kind of technologists who know the, the kind of current cutting edge technology tools and systems. Startups have that. We're going to, on some level, outsource our R&D to them. Startups have the ability to very quickly talk to customers, uh, you know, overlay, to take surveys. Maybe they do or don't do anything with them. Startups are built on talk to customer, build, iterate, talk to customer, build, iterate in a very quick, rapid cycle. Startups, on the other hand, need to understand that enterprises have systems for a reason, that moving fast and breaking things doesn't work, and that, you know, there's a lot you can learn from the enterprise partner who can tell you about scale and can tell you about uh, you know, risk management and all those kind of things. I think the early respect and, and appreciation for what you bring to the table and what you lack is, is what's important. Great. So let's open it up to some audience Q&A. It seems to me that Epic occupies a position in the healthcare industry that Microsoft used to occupy in the 90s, kind of a monopoly, kind of controlling things, kind of slowing things down. Why is it that the healthcare industry is not putting pressure at the government level, DOJ level, to force them to open up the data, the APIs? We are really talking about patient care and human lives. So why isn't there much of uh, an effort there? Well, I don't know that I can speak to that as an expert, but I do know that as hospitals, we do a lot of lobby work. We may not necessarily do it as individual hospitals, but we're members of the Washington State Hospital Association. There's various lobbying organizations within organ uh, associations like that that do lobby both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, you know, as far as specifics relative to Epic or even other software solutions, I mean, there are things that we work on. We try to work with them very closely. Dr. Knopfler implemented um, Epic at our hospital. It was a three-year process to get that implemented at the hospital. And so there was a lot of collab, going back to the conversations about the collaboration. I think you even mentioned it earlier about the fact whoever we are going to work with is going to have to work with us, our Epic team, but also with Epic at their corporate level because we're gonna, it's really going to have to be a partnership. So I don't have a great answer to you why we're not doing more. I will say we do lobby work. We mostly do it through our associations because, again, especially at our level, we're not big enough to have our own lobby arm, but we do work the dues that we pay to our association, and they do a lot of lobbying both state and federal-wise. Yeah, Epic is a bit more open than, than you, know, you might be led to believe. Um, a lot of it has to do with prioritization, and they have some very, very large customers like a Kaiser and you know, very, very large health systems, and they're always going to get the attention first and, and get the bandwidth to do the things that, that you need to do. Um, you know, they, they continue to make progress to be a bit more open. But it is, it is a challenge, and, and uh, one of the challenges was that you know, Epic set a very high price point because um, you know, some of the systems were very open and highly customizable, and you know, the Cerners and the Allscripts and, and companies like that got those customers. And the customers that were seeking absolute certainty, that were willing to say, we'll put it in the way you tell us to put it in, um, would get a, a higher likelihood that it would work out of the box what they're promised, but they paid a very high price for that, and by paying that high price, the, it, the price is almost too high to fail, so they keep investing more and, and, and you know, are, are somewhat boxed into that solution. So it's great to see you know, a place like Overlake looking outside, knowing that Reality is Epic's a little bit more open than they tend to than they say, and maybe there's a way to solve the population health issues and the scheduling and demand issues outside of that box, and it's a pretty smart way to go. Thank you. 
Um, I'm interested in access. So one of the things uh, that's been brought up in the conversation is that there are several different customers, so to speak, in different silos within an enterprise organization, and all of their um, cares need to be considered uh, and weighed and incentivized. But how does a startup get access to those people? Are, is there someone at Overlake, for instance, who would um, grab a startup who's interested in solving one of these problems and take them around the organization and introduce them to the people that they need to talk to? Um, that's that's what there's kind of a you know a shell around enterprise that's been. Um, you know, because it's it's a competitive market, so you mm -hmm. need to be you know private, and there's there's a, a patient information that needs to be taken care of. So, right. how 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 do you learn about that in an enterprise? How do you navigate that as a startup? Well, I mean, there's I, I would look at it, especially in this kind of an environment where we're doing this type of a a reverse pitch and actually putting a problem statement out there. I mean, we we want whoever ends up winning this competition to be successful. So we're going to open up whatever resources we need to to help it, whether it be, you know, Dr. Knopfler, Dr. Rochier from the physician side of it to be able to answer whatever questions come in, be able to look at, go, go to the urgent care center and see what the issues are, you know, be able to talk to the staff. I mean, we want this to be a successful arrangement. Um, you know, and we're uh, standing up other resources within the organization that can help. So under population health, uh, this year we're standing up what we call Overlake Provider Network. It's basically a way where we can bring our physicians, the hospital together currently to be able to try to be successful in this whole population health game. And eventually we're going to be adding uh, uh, other, um, you know, downstream kind of providers, whether it be long-term care, rehab facilities, SNFs, uh, eventually pharmacies, whoever they may happen to be, as we all have to start managing under bundle cares. But we're going to be open in this kind of an environment to be able to have folks, if they need their questions answered to be successful, I mean, I, I give people tours of the hospital on a fairly regular basis. I want people to understand what we offer, why we offer it, and why we think we do a really good job of it. So we're open to be able to do that, and especially in this type of an environment where we're, in, you know, in essence, asking folks to be able to put something together for us, we'll make the resources available that are necessary uh, as we get further into the process. Uh, 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 this is around the competition, um, since he sort of asked. W what if you have an, uh, uh, somebody who presents something that isn't exactly going after the problem statements that you put up, but is a very interesting solution? Are there other windows to startups to be able to get a pilot project that isn't specifically tackling those very large problems that you have put forth? Well, for Overlake specifically, I mean, this is new process for us, so I don't know that I have a great answer for you other than, you know, we're always looking for ways to solve solutions. So if through this process something else comes up and says, hey, this isn't exactly what you asked, but we think this would be really cool and really be great for your patients, I'm sure we're going to listen. So for the competition, um, since people are talking about it now, um, when we make our submission, uh, do we need to have uh, do we need to have our applications? Um, uh, do, do we have to uh, work with Epic? Um, do, do we have to implement Epic into our applications uh, when we're getting judged, or is Epic something we need to kind of worry about after uh, the competition is over? So typically speaking, what we've seen uh, in the programs that we've run is that the applications will contain specific information as to the proposal itself, so the solution that you're going to be uh, proposing, but doesn't need to get into the nitty gritty details of the IT implementation. That information would be figured out after the letter of intent is awarded to a given startup. Thanks, Optar. Do we have any questions related to the panel discussion? <laughs> Does it make sense for uh, a startup to work with some of these more established vendors that you've mentioned that you've already done business with? Uh, I could see the risks for the startup, but I'm wondering, does the hospital or the healthcare institution feel better about having somebody they already have a relationship with bring something new to, uh, to you? 
I don't think it has to be that way. I think I, I just mentioned specifically that from my experience, most of my work has been with established vendors, that's all. I was just being very honest. Um, we're here because we want to look at new opportunities, new technologies, somebody that can bring something fresh to us. So if somebody could do that, we're open for that. If somebody partnered with somebody else that maybe is kind of a more of a traditional uh, vendor type of uh, uh, company that we've been used to working with, I mean, that's fine as well. But what we're really looking for is the solution. That's what we're looking for. Sometimes that model works really well, the partner model. Um, when I was at Allscripts, we had an open API platform that would allow third parties to integrate into our software. And then we could offer it to, to the, the clients that way. And that worked extremely well because we built that open API that you could build your solution on top of. And then it appeared as if it was part of the application that the customers bought. And they would just have a whole you know, a laundry list of different innovations that they could buy either through us or through the partner. It depends on, on how it's done. And that model can work very well. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated and it puts a buffer between you know, the end user and, and, and the developer, and that makes it more challenging. But if the vendor that you're partnering with is willing to kind of you know, say, hey, look, we've tested and we validate that it works, that model can work quite well. Yeah, so, there, good? Go ahead. so there's a couple uh, wrinkles on that. So one is the kind of module within an existing solution. One is a, just a traditional channel sales where the salesman's going in and they're saying, here's our core product. We work with these third parties you could also purchase from, and there's a commission share. The, the third option is you know, hire somebody who's already sold into, a, into an organization, has relationships there, and hire them directly into your company. So find someone who's kind of run the playbook before for a, a larger, more established player, and then you know, does it again for you. And that can be very effective. Any other questions for the panelists? I haven't heard much about market segmentation, and we tend to develop things for the healthy wealthy instead of the 10% of people who cost 80%. So do you have any recommendations about what part of the market people might want to pursue, especially for a suburban hospital? Well, one thing is, obviously, Bellevue, where our hospital is, is an affluent community, but it's also changing. It's not the same community that was even five years ago. Uh, as we heard in the uh, city schools, uh, within Bellevue, there's between 60 and 80 languages that are spoken. We've become a much more diverse uh, 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 community. Uh, we also um, are, uh, have various levels of income within our uh, community as well, even though it's historically been an affluent. So the solutions that we're looking at, as far as we're concerned, take care of all of our patients. To me, it doesn't matter what level of income that patient has, whether they're on Medicaid, whether they're a self-pay, or whether they have uh, a concierge practice and they're paying all of their own um, medical care out of their pocket because they can afford to do that. To me, the solution should be the same. I mean, from our perspective, I think we were talking behavior change earlier. A lot of that's focused on the, the chronic ill. So you know, that's where a lot of the cost center is in the healthcare industry and, and certainly a lot of the economic opportunity if you can really reduce those costs and improve patient outcomes. So we're very interested in, in you know, a variety of solutions, but certainly ones that are focused on people that have uh, you know, major medical issues. How, uh, how does Overlake handle the progression in medical, dis the new medical products that come out, like innovation and um, like pharmacogenetics? Sure. So we actually have, you'd be surprised, we have a committee uh, that handles what's called new product development or new product innovations. And it could be pharmaceuticals, it could be uh, actual equipment, it could be certain supplies, implants, as you can imagine with a lot of the advanced care we're doing in cardiology, our neurosciences center, our vascular surgeons, there's a lot of implants are getting more complicated, more expensive. Uh, so all of those things go through new product evaluation uh, system, and that includes both clinicians as well as business folks that are evaluating that. Now, 
Yeah, what I'm, what I'm referring to is more that somebody, we're, we're providing a service. Somebody wants to do a surgery, but they want to use an implant that we've never used before. Or maybe they want to bring a new, there are times where maybe they want to do a new type of uh, surgery. For instance, when kyphoplasty came out, you know, when it was originally new, everybody had to evaluate, did that make sense? How much are we going to get paid? How much is it going to cost? So we look at it from both perspectives. So it could be something we're already doing, but there's new uh, technology or new supplies or new implants that we may have to evaluate or somebody might want to do a new surgery or a procedure at our facility that we've never done before and we evaluate that as well. Sometimes right. with something like pharmacogenetics um, you, you know it depends on the facility uh, uh, an a institution that has research going on might be much more apt to be an early adopter for something that doesn't necessarily have the, the body of data. They may be interested in collaborating with you to create the data. Smaller um, health system that, that you know, may not have a research arm, um, you know, br br having data that's been validated by a third party, by a recognized organization that, you know, that institution's comfortable with, that's going to be the absolute starting point. Um, and then, you know, the reimbursement questions and all the other things uh, come into play. But very, very important to have the data, especially, you know, an organization the size like of, of Overlake. Okay, we have time for one more question. Mine hits the challenge of being an entrepreneur in general. Um, I consider myself an idea person, but uh, I have no tech. I'm not a code monkey or anything to do with infrastructure. Um, but when you look at these challenges that you put in front of us, I'm sure you have people in your organization who have nailed the idea right in the head. This is what would work. Okay, let's go out there and find out who can do it for us. Um, so I guess from Michael's, your perspective, running into idea people, what's the advice you would give them on how to create the relationships and partnerships with the doers. Don't call them code monkeys. <laughs> Start. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, unfortunately, that's a, a very common problem. And it's, it's true on both sides. There are people who have incredible technical skills who, who really don't have the, um, the business sense or the ability to scope out a problem and, and kind of create a user interface that, that people are going to want to use. So it's not a, a one-sided problem, but it's, it's a problem. And so. Um, coming to events like this and coming to more, you know, startup technology oriented events where there's going to be people of both disciplines around, going to hackathons, those kind of things can be a good kind of founder dating type of process where you meet somebody, you, you know, spitball a few ideas, I really want to build something in this arena, you have any intellectual curiosity in that arena. Um, when it comes to founders, people should be really equally passionate about the idea. You don't want somebody who's, you know, doing it just for a paycheck. You know, technologists won't work on problems for very long that they're not excited about. So spend time around people who build software and talk to them about your idea and find somebody who's got an intellectual curiosity in this domain is probably the best advice I can give you. And, and uh, yeah. You should, um, you should start a startup that matches business and technology folks together. Founderdating.com exists. It does, it does. Founderdating.com, people. Um, but with that, I want to thank the panelists for sharing their insights. Really appreciate your time. Um, I, I do want to, I think we have some time to maybe answer some Q&A about the application process. Yes. <laughs> three, three questions or so about the application process, but thank you all for, for being here. Okay, so questions on the application process. No need for mics, just... So, yeah, yeah, so actually if you go to the next slide, one more, okay, so on the last slide there's actually the website that you can apply on and everything you need to do is Q&A on the website, so it's very straightforward. So the idea will be presented during, in the actual application, but the... Um, for like demos and things like that, that would be actually when you come to Enterprise Challenge, bringing demos or screenshots or whatever would be really good.